everyone. So in this talk, I'm going to rant a bit uh, about I.O. CTLs or I.O. controls or I.O. cuddles, whatever, however it is that you, want, you guys want to pronounce that. Uh, for a long time, I've been seeing that we, we have been still using them um, on block layer and file systems and um, some background. Um, I, I used to work on networking and I saw the change in networking. Um, so let me, let me elaborate first on some rants and then I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to James. Well, before you do that, you could have spelled it right. <laughs> There's an F missing. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, some history first um, on the introduction to I.O. control into uh, Unix world. Uh, so it wasn't really designed originally for what we think it was, right? It's essentially a hack, right? So the history talks about it that it is a closet full of skeletons, right? Um, and it was somehow exempt from the ethos of simplicity that kept the lid and new system calls. Uh, so just keep this in mind, right? Because everyone's just like, hey, what's the problem with this IO controls, right? Just keep in mind that it was a hack, right? Um, and this is from the history books as well, document, documented willy-nilly uh, and sometimes only in source. Just keep that in mind, right? Um, so in, in Linux too, it wasn't actually, when Linux was first released, it didn't really have IO controls either. Uh, it was actually introduced slightly later, about a year later after the first release. And then in 93, we have just one small little patch to modify IO controls as well, right? Um, so, you know, just some generic overview of this stuff, you know, the compact stuff, in case that's confusing, this is essentially what, what it does. Uh, the compact stuff is 30 put, uh, addresses 32-bit system calls issued on 64-bit systems. Uh, so kind of some of the um, issues. Um, is let's, let's just recap that given the history that I just explained, brief history. Uh, it's not originally um, designed for what we're using it for today. Uh, it was a hack, let's just admit that, right? Let's not defend that position in any way, shape, or form. Um, the concept of that everything is a file is really useful, right? So we can just obviously use IO control for pretty much anything in the kernel, right? Um, so you can argue that it does allow a lot of flexibility. I argue that that's true, but it also allows for lazy uh, architecture and design. Um, also, some user space APIs don't even have support for it. You know, Java is one example, right? Um, it doesn't promote documentation, and uh, introspection is also a problem. Now, I, I will admit, introspection is not something that I actually have dealt with, and it's not a problem that I have dealt with. So I was wondering if James might be able to elaborate on, on some of that. I don't know if um, that's a, a problem space that you, you're familiar with. Yeah, I can. I mean, it comes from the, it comes from the container world, where uh, we have lots of, um, I mean, it's not just introspection for um, I.O. controls, it's introspection for things like system calls. You know, if you want to secure a, a weird Docker container, you block loads of system calls using SecComp. But if there's an alternative way they can get around the system call you just blocked by using an I.O. control, which you don't introspect and you don't see it happening, your security is worthless. So there's a lot of security concern about non-introspectable interfaces because they can't be policed properly by the tools we usually use for containers like setconf, even ebpf. You, you actually, um, the, the specific I.O. control problem is that it's just a dense binary packet. So there's no structure that you can deduce from the form of the packet about what it contains. And that's basically why I.O. controls are listed as non-introspectable. Now in theory, we could make the kernel speak XML or JSON, but in fact, all you just get is a load of random tags. You could theoretically introspect slightly better, but only if you knew the schema, which usually isn't transmitted anyway. So you sort of transform an, a dense binary problem into a slightly less dense ASCII problem. So this introspection thing is always going to be with us almost regardless of the interface we choose. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, I asked Arndt for an opinion, um, and he really told me exactly how he felt, um, and there it is. Uh, there's a bit of uh, historic issues with architecture support on I.O. control as well. Here's some, uh, a list of uh, itemized things that he could think of. So it's not, it's not, the world is not peachy, 
either for architecture support as well. Um, then, like, this is just batshit, right? Like, what the hell? Why, how, why, how is this possible? Like, from a design perspective, this just makes no sense. Granted, of course, you have root, you can do anything you want, but this is just stupid, right? Um, so yeah, um, just because it, you know, it shouldn't happen, we allow for it, right? It's just silly. Go ahead and try it. Really, try that. See what happens. Um, so is, is the grass greener? Well, um, one can't get spoiled, right? So I just want to provide some perspective. I come from the you know wireless world, right? So uh, I don't know if you guys remember wireless extensions. Anyone remember that? Like IW config world? No? Holy crap. Well, um, please, 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 if you want to uh, get some context of where I'm coming from, uh, for the love of DID, you know, DD, whatever, just look at the Linux UAPI wireless.h and compare that to the NL8011. Now, granted, this is a complete change to, to generic Netlink. And we have we did have shortly the discussion on the mailing lists about the fact that it's not really designed to be generic enough, and perhaps you know we don't want to use something like uh, generic Netlink. Uh, so I do think that you know even though that is the case, it doesn't mean that we can't come up with something better generic for you know file systems and the block layer. Uh, so I'd like to hand it this off now to James. Okay, fine, but I'm not really going to uh, defend. Can config FD was a thing I came up with for a long time ago when we were doing the shifting bind man, which has now been replaced by um, uh, uh, the thing Christian was talking about yesterday, whose name I've forgotten. But what config FD did is it was based on FS config, which we now use for the mount subsystem, where you basically open a file descriptor using a system call, you send lots of configuration stuff down to the file descriptor and then atomically it does everything you want it to do. The main difference that configfd had from fsconfig is that it was bidirectional. You could pull information back out of the configurational file descriptor as well. One of the things I did for um, fsconfig is just when I tried to introduce configfd, I rewrote everything in terms of uh, uh, configfd to demonstrate that it was actually a, s a superset of fsconfig. Can I just interject something? Uh, uh, FS config did have a bit that allowed you to get stuff back out, but Al removed it before it got upstream. Yeah, I know. So, so I'm not really here to defend this. What I, what I, what I think I wouldn't really like to spend all of my time talking about config FD. What I'd like to talk about is the necessity of I/O controls because. Effectively, what an I.O. control is, is a, it's an exceptional exception to the normal semantic order of things. And however regulated we try and make the semantic order of things, we always get these exceptions. So there's always going to be a way, uh, a requirement for a way that two parties can communicate using data that's not structured by the existing semantic, and that is an I.O. control. Whether you're sending it to JSON, XML, binary data, we're always going to have a need from them. And the problem isn't getting rid of I.O. controls. The problem is that, which is to your point, what you were complaining about, if the operation could be done using the semantic we already had in place, it should be. So people who program an I.O. control where we could have got the semantic to work are the ones who are doing it wrong. That's what causes the I.O. control explosion. But I believe if we could be very careful and sort of regulate about I.O. controls and document them, um, they have a place in our ecosystem. And the, the bigger problem is how do we actually introspect them? Because containers hate I.O. controls just because you're, you're bunging binary data down and we have no idea whether it's going to do something with the attack surface, give you root control, allow a containment breakout, whatever. It's, it's sort of trying to find a way of introspecting all of this correctly, which sort of goes down to documentation, is really what we're probably looking for in the container world. I think for the... Uh <coughs> that's a generic problem for uh, for containers, especially coming from the SecOM side, which is still the default thing that most people use. And I think uh, Case and I gave a presentation about this uh, in Kernel Summit a few years back, right before the pandemic, I think. Um, 
we need a solution for this as well in SECOMP. Uh, not necessarily as we originally thought that you are able to introspect, so actually look into structs and parse out arguments and so on from structs. Um, so the problem here being if you make a system call that passes down a pointer, SECOMP doesn't know anything to do about this. You, you can't really you know, filter, for example, in uh, members and structs, SECOMP. But uh, actually, let's just clarify for the room. So what Christian is talking about is it's not just I.O. controls. We have a lot in of system yep. calls that are multiplexes that you really don't. Yeah, not just, not just multiplex. We have, <coughs> so SECOMP is becoming a burden in a way. I don't want to steal your time too much. SECOMP is becoming a burden in a way because it limits the way uh, how we could, or for a long time, it limited the way how we could design system system calls, especially now that it becomes more and more important with containers because uh, pointer arguments were s discouraged. So for example, passing down structs in uh, new system calls, somebody would always reply on this, what about seccomp? Seccomp can't filter based on, the, based on the struct. And the problem with this is that we do have uh, use cases for structs and system calls, where we want the system call, for example, to be extensible, or it just has a lot of a reasonable uh, amount of uh, arguments and so on. So this is a generic problem that sticks with us. And SECOMP needs to be taught how to at least, for example, do some checksumming that you can verify whether the arguments have been re uh, rewritten while you performed the system call and so on. So that's a problem on, on sort of slightly to the side of this whole problem, but it needs to be uh, solved as well. Yep. So if I can lift a larger point from that, if we just banned all I.O. controls and said you had to use system calls, all that would happen is the problem would migrate from the I.O. controls to the system calls. Yeah, yeah so I mean, I th something just simply to extend on your uh, Star Trek references uh, in your slide deck, um, you know, from the original Star Wars, the more you tighten your grip, Tarkin, the more star systems will slip through your fingers, <laughs> right? Part of the problem is that uh, we do want to have a very, very good architectural control over system calls. So in order to get a system call through, it goes through a massive bike shedding activity. You know, it has to be documented. People ask all these questions. The seccomp people come out of the room. And here's one of the things, right? Which is if you're a device driver, author, or even maintainer, you may not care about containers. Maybe they should. Maybe supporting containers is a tax we should impose on the entire community, right? However, what happens is the tighter and more perfect we try to make system calls, the more there is a very, very extreme uh, sort of incentive to uh, sort of move things into ioptals where we can dodge the bike shedding. Because sometimes the bike shedding is important, other times it is a huge burden, right? And I, I won't say who, but someone already once, uh, I heard someone say, well, you know, in order to avoid the bike shed, I'll do the ioctal in my file system, and then we'll t later on see if we uplift it to uh, other file systems, because that avoids the FS Devel bike shed party, right? And there are good reasons, and we certainly miss things in terms of architectural review if we you know, dodge you know, some of these processes. But I think people do need to remember, the more perfect we try to make things, most of us do not have infinite resources. I, I, right? I, I just <laughs> want to point that I don't think well, you, sh you should first thank Princess Leia for her comment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's uh, the right argument to make that the only alternative here is system calls. Uh, I don't think we're making that argument. What we're saying is the perfect is the enemy of the good, effectively, if I can quote someone who's not Star Wars related, at least I don't think he is. Up in here. Okay. Right, so we, want, we, 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 we need to accept in our development process that what we do isn't perfect and there will always be exceptions. We just need to make sure that we don't do the exceptions too often. Yeah, There's also sure. an additional constraint, if that's the right term. Uh, there are at least two cl separate classes that ioptals fall into. Some of them are like setting stuff up and config FB would work quite well for those because the timing doesn't matter. But some of them have to be, c have to be fast. You can't go 
create a f file descriptor, do something. Well, with yeah, but config FD had that because the creation was just the setup, and then the thing that you oh. atomically set it going could do that instantaneously. I, if we're going to be talking about config FD, could we see the proposal? Oh, it was a patch sent onto the list years ago. I really don't think I you can want look it up to see if the you guys proposal. really want to see that. That's something that. Awesome. So I, I guess what I should say, what we should do is focus on what do we want to do instead, because. Yes. I will, for, you can, you're gonna pry articles from my cold dead hands unless you give me something else because ButterFS does a lot of things and we've wasted a lot of time in these architectural bike sheds that just ended up being like, oh well, yeah, you're right, let's just put it in an iOctal. Like the community said, you're right, you know what, let's just put it in an iOctal and that was a year wasted, Omar? Like I, I, I think, uh, articles anyway. Uh, and so the art tools we have here. aren't going away huh? well, because there are too many things using them. Or s or s or some of the art tools aren't going away. Right, and I yeah. think I'm standing up here to argue that used judiciously, IO controls are probably the best way of doing stuff, possibly yeah. with some sort of introspection data that allows us to solve some of the seccom problems we have with them. Right, and so like you know, this is the th this is the like you don't the code is in the documentation thing. Like, okay, that's not great. But like these structs are put in new API, they're they Why have names. Are we on no, I'm looking for content. I, I think our articles are getting vilified a lot here, and I don't think all of it Lewis, necessarily makes sense. I'm defending. I'm defending. Lewis, okay. config okay. FD. Okay. Config FD. I continue. Uh, uh, all an article really is is a driver-specific syscall. That's that's all it is, and there's a real need for that. Uh, part of that bike shedding process you're talking about, Ted, for for something to become a, a real system call. Uh, IOctals can and should be a part of that bike shedding process. Before something becomes a system call, oftentimes we should try it out in a in an area where there's where it's not so permanent, uh, where where it's more private to a, a file system or so on. And and not everything needs to get promoted to the system call level, anyways. Uh, and there's also I, I think we should be defining the scope of the problem here. IOctals do have some very real problems, but we don't need to necessarily redesign everything from the from the ground up we should define this the scope of the problem here yeah uh, one of the one of the problems that we were talking about this morning was that Ted? Oh, I just want to say that to, to uh, add on the principles layer you know if I was in that situation you said I'm gonna pull I don't have IRC details so I'm good but if I did and you said get rid of those call IRC details McKenna you're being evil I'd say fine, and I just make another device, and I go do reason right and get the same thing done. So you know, I'm there for you. Right. You know, we, you know, <laughs> if you, if you get too vicious, we'll just invent our way out of the corner, and not necessarily in a way that helps, right? Right. Yeah. I th and this is kind of my point, right? Like, what are we trying to solve? Is it introspection? I think like if we we want to make it easier to to identify what the interface is and what it does. Uh, you know, I am a giant Netlink fanboy, but and I will scream Netlink from the top of the. That, that's me. So I'm the one who says IO controls are fine and used in moderation. Our main problem with them is introspection. That's I sort of my position. Y yeah, I think what confused me a little bit is that I don't config in, in general might be a good idea for some stuff, but I don't think it's it necessarily relates to a or it is a good replacement for a octals. Right. So uh, it, the the real thing here is just uh, it doesn't seem like we have thought of like a generic way to abstract all these things that we do need and to express them in a way that's perhaps not just an IOctal or, you know, system calls. I don't think we've yet even thought of that, right? This seems to be like a generic issue, right? It's just like once you have something in networking and maybe with file system, maybe you work on something, you know, in that area, but something generic doesn't seem to exist. But it's so not. That's the point I was trying to make. I mean, what we try to do in computing is set up uh, fairly universal semantics that work for us, and what we always find is there are exceptions to the semantics we've set up, and we need some mechanism for coping with those exceptions. Yes. There is no perfect world where everything fits into one semantic, and we just haven't found the one true semantic yet. There will always be e edge cases where we have to root around the system, and we need a mechanism for doing that, and IO controls is as good as anything else. Well, like, for instance, uh, Dave, maybe you can comment on the history of you know, this config, you know, like how that came about and all that. For instance, just a, as an example. Louis, I want to add the perspective. Yes. Um, that we all talk about, should we have IOCTOs? I think most of us agree that we need IOCTOs to try new things, 
But something we haven't talked about is how to graduate from a new thing, like a staging API, uh, to a properly documented API, and Ted mentioned this yesterday. There was an ancient XT2 IOCTAL for uh, LS uh, Acker Chata, and then other file systems also implemented that, and XFS had another one, and the both of them were merged. And now, recently, uh, it was uh, standardized as a VFS API. So yeah. it's the same IOCTAL from ages ago. It, it's only easy to, but this demonstrates the problem. If you're reinventing the same thing over and over again in your- No, in it's not reinventing, it was adopting. It was no, no, adopting the, the technology. The point that is that XFS did something and put this- the, the No, same. no, no, there were two technologies invented in parallel. Right. And then they were standardized and uh, uh, hoisted up into the VFS. And uh, the whole thing is now pretty much standardized, right, but, but it still lives in the same space of IOCTALS. It's All that is missing, basically, is documenting it as an ABI. And then all the tools, I mean, S-Trace already knows how to parse those things, but it's not standardized. So maybe a better, uh, uh, well, a more another instructive example to look at might be the new mount API, right? right. Uh, Where exactly. we had to, de we defined an entirely new system call. It is a little bit like config FD that you can send down. No, no, lots it's exactly like because yeah. I, I config FD was a rewrite of FS config initially, right. but it ends up being um, very purpose specific. Right. Yeah, the, and the reason it's purpose specific and the reason I wrote config FD is because it requires a mount and a super block. And if you don't have that, you can't use uh, FS config on it. This that was the problem. To Ted's, to Ted's right. point, what I like about the new mount API is what, and what scared me a little bit about config FD was that it's a specific, at least, uh, it's a specific FD type. And c config FD made it so that it would always be a config FD. No matter so, no matter what. For example, if you used config fd to set up something for a, a new file system API to configure something, or config fd for something to I don't know do process management in the kernel subsystem, it would always be the same fd underlying a non i node fd type, and that kind of always bothered me. So that separate APIs, for example, an API that deals with kernel process management and an API that deals with uh, file system management, they should be separate fd types if they use some sort of a FD type based management. But that doesn't mean you couldn't use the same infrastructure things on it. So you maybe you have a, a PID config, an FS config, and then you use the well go to uh, the, the config FD stuff on top of it. This patch four of six. Because Four? You're yeah. you're often using it's just a set key you're doing set key value paired and type. So this, this patch basically used config FD as an infrastructure for FS config. So you'd built the more specific on top of the less specific. Yeah, and okay. config FD could live like that and you, you never really actually see it in the wild. You just do things like this on top of it. Maybe it's worthwhile to sort of separate mechanisms and I don't think you want to look through all policy, of it. You've seen the patch years ago. Right, there. there are multiple mechanisms uh, it is absolutely, ra I don't know who said it, but ioctals and system calls, they're basically the same thing, right? It's essentially a function call into the kernel. Um, and you know you have a multiplexing thing, whether it's the syscall number or the ioctal number, and then a random set of arguments. That's one way. You can do something like flash proc, fl flash sys, where you're echoing ASCII strings into magic files, you can do something like config FD or the new mount API, where it's a, you know, you're basically sending attributes and then you send a commit, right? These are all mechanisms. The policy is how painful is it to add a new system call? How painful is it to add a new ioctal? How careful do we need to be before we extend the mount API, right? That's where the devil is in the but I, I don't. Right. I don't really think it's fair to just say that the alternative is system calls, and considering the implications of your view on system calls and the designs of system calls, that's. I don't think but that's. But there, from a technical perspective, there is no difference. The only difference is how much pain you have to go through before you can actually get a new system call in. If you actually look at it from a ten thousand foot level, there is no difference. 
there, there's some details that do matter. Of C structures, the IOPTL takes a number of C structures. The only difference is how is it documented so that people can actually do the introspection, right? If every single IOPTL had to go through the exact same process that we did with system calls, then introspection would not be a problem because it would all be documented. There would be required man pages for it all. It'd be extremely painful to add a new IOPTL, though it's really stable, which makes well, it a whole just, lot easier just to get on. And then people would find an escape hatch because it would be too painful, right? That, that this is the natural I'll, I'll, order just, just to give you some a counter to this, right? When you extend the wireless world with a new command or new technologies or whatever, we're not adding you know new system calls for new features or anything like that. We're addressing problems from a domain specific place. So that's that's kind of like my point here is that we can reduce the scope of how it is that you present what it is that you need to you know uh, modify or deal with. I'm having a. I'm ha just having a hard time seeing what we could replace I uh, what we could replace I offers with honestly I know you had the netlink uh, proposal um, that that, yeah sorry. I mean that's just that's just an example you, you right I understand yeah. you can't use netlink because yeah. if there's if the network system is not compiled in you wouldn't be able to do ioptals not just that I, I also think netlink is actually in terms of api usage much more complicated than uh, than ioptals for uh, for user space. Yeah, it, might, it might be actually more convenient to replace Netlink with Configure Free. Are well, good luck selling that to Dave Miller. <laughs> <laughs> Are we about to reinvent inter-process communication? There are many inter-process communication protocols that uh, support introspection and support uh, documentation in a machine-readable way of Well, uh, let's, let's back up. I would hope everything supports documentation. The problem is we don't create it. Right, to Ted's point of the scrutiny we undergo or don't undergo to add these things. IPC can be exactly the same. It can actually be a multiplexer as well, and if you didn't document it, nobody knows what you've done, and you can't I introspect it properly. Iron did a g good amount of work in um, making uh, IOCTLs uh, better or uh, easier to use, but y yeah, there are certainly are problems. Uh, what could be helpful, for example, is if you have IOCTLs in a specific subsystem. Let's stick with the, with the, with the file systems. Um, <coughs> one thing, for example, that, I, that, bot that bothered me when I, when I did work in the VFS that had to touch a bunch of file systems is that there are certain APIs that circumvent the permission checking of the VFS, for example, creating objects or creating new objects uh, within the file system through uh, an IOCTL. And I know where this comes from. I know totally that makes a lot of sense uh, in the beginning, but the problem is it, it makes permission checks get forgotten because they need to be duplicated from the VFS and so on. Um, and some, I would, for example, would be in favor of, of having some documentation that would state, don't duplicate permission checking in your IOCTLs. Try to avoid going behind the VFS's back when you create new things. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, uh, but it's, it's back to the same thing. There was a semantic in an exception, and when you create an exception, you forget all of the pieces of semantic you should be obeying. The real thing is that the IO, contro IO controls are something as a band-aid <coughs> and really sh should be treated as that or whether IO controls are pa part of the API. Well, they're and part we, no, we don't already established that. They're part of the API because there is no perfect semantic that could replace all IO controls, I think, unless anybody disagrees with that position. Yes, but if they're part of the API, then um, mm -hmm. There is no need yeah, for yeah, IO controls to be IO replaced. IO controls is part of the API, it's just have we documented them or not. I mean, I, I, I just, you know, I provided the example of in the wireless world, right, where we're inventing and adding a new IO control for every single little, little new feature. And then we ran out, then we ha started doing sub-IO CTLs, and then now we have generic netlink. When you look at the documentation that's forced upon new commands and all those features, we're not inventing system calls. And it's very specific and tied to the wireless objects. So yes, th the grass can be greener, but I'm just saying I don't have the answer to that. I just look at what we have today, and I think it's a fucking mess. Well, I think part of the mess is we have reinvented IO controls over and over again with things like Netlink and Config F FD and what have you. 
uh, even from Digger Less, I suppose. The question might be why, if we could examine why we keep doing this. Because if you look at what I said, it's a semantic and an exception. And theoretically, IO control should cover all of that use case. The fact that we invent other systems for doing this instead indicates that it doesn't. Yeah, I think you guys keep over-engineering it when we need something simple. An octal is just a driver-specific syscall, so why don't we just do a better driver-specific syscall, driver-private syscall? So one concrete problem that we've got with octals is that there's, there's no real namespacing. You're picking a small integer that may or may not collide with some other octal driver uh, registered. And I think where this really causes the problems is, as Ted mentioned yesterday, uh, when octals get promoted from a driver to, say, the DFS layer, that can happen with just changing a pound of line, which means it happens without any real review. And we paint ourselves into some silly messes. Uh, I've always liked how uh, OpenGL extensions work where there's actual namespacing. And so vendors will create extensions that start with NVIDIA or uh, ATI. And a anyone can reg uh, create extensions that don't conflict because they're not just integers, uh, that don't conflict with other extensions. And then when something gets promoted to uh, the standard, then you'll, that's done by defining a new extension with a different name. And I think that would, if we had that, that would make it much more likely that review happened at the appropriate time. Well, at this point, unfortunately, we're out of time, so I think we should probably take this up on a lightning session or something like that. And thank you, though. Yep, thank you very much. Thanks.